is your main standing for our affirmation of faith, which is printed in your bulletin. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and in others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Yeah, the Statue of Liberty looks a little <laughs> But we are, after all, the church. 
So uh, this crown is on a figure that we think is probably going to be Jesus. And what is Jesus doing? Erasing a line that's been drawn. How do the other characters feel about that? And, yeah, there's one of them that's in front and he's turned around and what has he got on his face? Yeah, he's got a big frown. How dare you do that, Jesus? And Jesus has got his big pencil upside down like this, just erasing a line. What do you think this is about? Hmm. When we go about our lives, we like things to be in our proper place. Maybe not in our rooms, which might be a little messy, but we want to know where things are. Right? We know where the things are that you're looking for in your room, right? Even if it's messy, right? We like to put people and things in their proper place so we know how to deal with them. When we do that, we're essentially drawing lines and boundaries like this grid that's on the ground there. So what's Jesus doing with that? He's erasing it. How do you think Jesus might be erasing some of the lines we drew? Yeah, it might be that we maybe drew it in the wrong place, or that's not a boundary. <coughs> Can you think of a boundary that Jesus might erase? That's a tough question. A boundary is something between um, two areas, right? So like a river breaks up two pieces of land, or this wall right here breaks up our chapel from the pews and, and from the chapel. It's a, something in between. It's usually solid, like this, but sometimes they're invisible. <laughs> Sometimes we put a barriers between like the smart kids in class and those who are struggling. Sometimes we put barriers between the kids we want to talk to and the ones we don't. Right? Um, we have our favorite spot at the lunch table and we don't have other people to be there. There are all kinds of boundaries, physical, solid, that we put in place that Jesus might knock down, and there are a lot of them you can't see that are invisible that Jesus might knock down or erase. What about what about the house that that has made into a a Yeah, um, that might be an example of a good boundary. If you take a house and you divide it up into apartments, more people can live there sometimes, right? Um, it's not always obvious what boundaries Jesus might knock down and which ones he might draw. But I want to give each of you a pencil, which you can use to doodle on the back of this doodle if you like. But I want you to think about if, if I am in this situation, would, would Jesus be drawing something here, or writing, or would he be erasing? Does that make sense? Would Jesus be helping to make sure this is exactly the way it is, or would Jesus be erasing and drawing something here? Big ideas. Let's pray. God, we thank you for sending Jesus to show us how to live together. Lord, in our life, we like to put up boundaries. We like to put up physical and invisible barriers between us and other people, between things in our lives. Lord, help us to imagine Jesus with a pencil. Would he be helping to confer, to add a barrier or boundary, or would he be erasing the ones in front of us? Lord, help us be brave when we need to erase the boundary and draw closer to someone else. Through Jesus we pray. Amen.
gospel lesson comes today from Mark in the fifth chapter, verses 21 through 43. Now, normally we stand for our gospel lesson, but I want to invite you to be seated. There are 22 verses here, and when we hear these words, we might initially hear two stories, but Mark has paired these, interrupted one with the other, and so I want you to be able to hear what I'm reading and pay attention instead of to how tired your feet are. And I want you to reflect on why Mark put these two episodes together. What do these stories say to each other? How are they similar? And how do they add up to a greater whole? When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, named Jairus, came and when he saw him fell at his feet and pleaded with him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So Jesus went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now, there was a woman who had been suffering from a flow of blood for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had, and she was no better, but rather worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, for she said, If I but touch his cloak, I will be made well. Immediately, her flow of blood stopped, and she felt in her body she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my cloak? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you? How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came back from the synagogue leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the synagogue leader, Do not be afraid, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the synagogue leader's house, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. And he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha Kuom, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl stood up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this, and told them to give her something to eat. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here, and we pray that you be not simply in our hearing, but in our deep soul understanding. We pray that we would hear you, body, mind, spirit, and relationship, and let your healing be at work in us as well. Through Jesus, we pray. When we are reading scripture, it's important for us to not only focus on whatever the selected scripture is for the day or for our devotion, but also to think about what has come right before and what comes right after the scripture. It's helpful to understand what's really happening 
in fragments. For instance, if we look right before this text, we will have found that Jesus, who by the way is the Jewish Messiah, has just healed a Gentile man in Gentile territory. And now he's crossed back over the Sea of Galilee to Jewish precincts. You see, early in his ministry, already, this is just Mark chapter 5, Jesus is breaking barriers in his ministry. He has just broken the barrier between Jew and Gentile. He has acted for healing for not his own people. And now he will approach two other kinds of barriers. The one between clean and unclean, and the barrier between life and death, which for us feels pretty final. It's also helpful to step, take a step further back to think about the context of Jewish rules about purity. We, as people, like to have rules and understanding of what is clean and is not clean in order to navigate the world. You know, we wouldn't call our backyard dirty, right? It, it's outside. It's got dirt. That's where dirt belongs and it helps the grass to grow or to, you know, crunch in our case right now. But if you wallow outside in your backyard and walk into your living room onto the carpet, it's now dirty. Dirt implies something is where it is not supposed to be. And something about that thing in that location defies our categories. It is true that often when something is dirty, we have to think about danger of infection, but there's something more pernicious at work in how we think about dirt and dirtiness. Do you remember in elementary school the worry about catching cooties? <laughs> It seems a silly game, perhaps, perhaps one that helps us think about germs and remembering to wash our hands and being careful. But if you look back, who was the most likely to have cooties? Who was it that you didn't want to touch? In racial and ethnic and class bigotry, whatever the despised group is, nearly always gets described as dirty. Have you noticed that? Those with fewer changes of clothes or reduced access to good water and hygiene may be physically dirty, but the implication when we call people dirty is that they are where they do not belong. Like dirt on a living room carpet, others are in our midst. Like most religious cultures, ancient Israel cared about ritual cleanliness. This resulted in some purity practices recording, recorded in scripture, such as menstruating women were allegedly unclean, as well as corpses, such that anyone and anything they touched became unclean as well. The desire behind these rules was a good one. God deserves our best, after all, so anything unclean shouldn't be brought before God. For example, you would not bring a blind sheep or a bird with a broken wing as your sacrifice to God. After all, God has given us the best, and we need to offer our best in return. But in Jesus' day, the Pharisees were trying to spread religious standards that were for the temple, about sacrifices to ordinary people. It seemed egalitarian, but they were applying to everyone rules reserved primarily for temple elite, particularly those they labeled unclean lepers or women with chronic menstrual bleeding, folks who are unclean, 
were then isolated and even from ordinary social affairs. It's easy to look down our noses at those of Jesus' day and think, oh, well, we don't do that. We do not keep people shunted aside. But I want to remind you that even though half of the world's population deals with periods for an average of 40 years of their life, it's a taboo subject. It's difficult to talk about even in your own household when you're making grocery lists. And it's difficult to preach on as well. But it's here in the middle of what's called a Markham sandwich. The Gospel writer Mark really likes nesting one episode inside another, like a big sandwich. And our temptation is to deal with one and then the other separately. But Mark has spent time crafting these two like a sandwich that we need to bite through together. Doing this does three things. It ratchets up our suspense. We have one cliffhanger. Jairus has come. His daughter is at the point of death. He is knelt before Jesus, who has the power to heal her. And then there's this woman to deal with. And we want to know what happens to Jairus' daughter. But Mark uses these stories not only to create suspense and drama for us, but to use one story to throw light on the other. And these two stories together mean more than just the sum of their parts. We should resist thinking when we come across a Mark and sandwich that these are two episodes. This is one story Mark has cobbled together for us to reflect on. At the beginning, Jairus, who is a leader of the synagogue, so he is respected and knowledgeable in the community, he's an important person, but he comes and falls at Jesus' feet and pleading that Jesus would please come to his house and save his daughter. He was at the point of death. He is calling out of the depths of desperation, like the psalm writer we heard from this morning. He's asking Jesus that his daughter be made well and live. This, the word he uses to make this request of Jesus is the Greek word, sozo. Sozo means to save, to heal, to rescue. This word is used repeatedly in this Markham sandwich. And the word itself blurs the distinction between salvation and help, and between saving and thriving. Jesus agrees to go with Jairus to the dying girl, but along the way, the crowds press in on Jesus. To get to him, there's one woman in the crowd who pushes through, and she has been bleeding for 12 years. She's got a hemorrhage. She's spent all her money on doctors, and she is now destitute and without resources. And for all of that, she's physically worse than ever. She's ritually unclean, an outcast, and she's in great pain. Many of us know what that feels like physically, but all of us, regardless of gender, know what it means to suffer much. Those moments where your energy, your life, your resources seem to be draining away from you faster than you can replenish them. And you need desperate rescue, salvation, help. In this circumstance, the woman's audacity and persistence is striking. Not only does she push through the crowd, but she pushes through the words of Leviticus too. And those ideas that not only she's unclean, but everything she touches will become unclean as well, including the one whose clothing she's reaching out to touch. 
everything so far suggests what the woman is doing is wrong or dishonorable or both. An unclean outcast, she pushes through the crowd, disobeying ancient prohibitions. And she audaciously touches the holy teacher without his permission, apparently desecrating him in the process. And it turns out she delays him on this important, time-sensitive, life-and-death situation when Jesus turns and stops and demands to know who touched me. You can imagine a collective gasp coming from the crowd. Jesus must be angry with her. Look, and, and she knows it too. She comes crawling forward in front of him on her knees in fear and troubling. But the story pivots here in a stunning and scandalous direction. Jesus is not angry. With everyone looking on, Jesus praises the woman for her audacity, for her daring, for her persistence, for her faith, which has made her well. And at that very moment, when Jesus is calling this woman daughter, Jairus hears word that his daughter is gone. It is too late. Your daughter is dead. Jesus says to him, don't fear, only believe. Because of what's just happened, it's as if Jesus is saying to Jairus, look, this woman has just shown you what genuine faith looks like. It's audacious and daring, a persistent trust in God. No barrier can constrain God's gracious mercy even a barrier between life and death. So Jesus sends everyone away but the girl's family and Peter, James, and John. This should be a clue to us that something really important is happening because Peter, James, and John are the three that are with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the Mount of Transfiguration. There's something important being revealed here. Taking the dead girl's hand in his and calling her to rise, Jesus breaks two barriers at once. Not only the barrier between clean and unclean, but the barrier between life and death. This little girl's rising foreshadows Jesus' own resurrection and ours as well. These two episodes together form one single story. They are a vivid picture of Jesus' expansive, barrier-breaking, healing, saving, life-giving ministry. Reading it, we might be tempted to take a step back. Did she, an unclean woman, really just touch the holy teacher's robe? And, and did he just touch a stranger's corpse? Jesus will have none of our disgust and separation. He literally reaches out to touch those whose touch is supposed to make him unclean. And the power flows in the opposite direction. They don't pollute him. He cleanses them, raising the question of whether they were polluted in the first place. Jesus breaks ethnic and socio-political barriers between Jews and Gentiles, and now he breaks barriers within the re religious life that demean and separate us with contempt. Notice what Jesus doesn't do here. He does not give us new rules about who is clean and unclean. He challenges the appropriateness of those categories in the first place. And once we realize that people, although they might have dirt on them, are not dirty, and dirt can be washed off, and the whole world looks different. This woman is even cast as an exemplar 
which is more surprising because here's a religious leader, Jairus. He's a leader in the community. He's studied scripture. He's important, but he's the one learning here from her, an outcast who has brought center stage and an insider is encouraged to learn from her. Jairus has approached Jesus from the front in his full and plain view, and this woman has had to go around the back. This woman, society would have dismissed as less important, but Jesus attended to her first and welcomed her as daughter into his symbolic family. Jairus' daughter seems lost to death while Jesus and the narrative pause over this woman. But notice, Jairus' daughter is healed too. In our society, we tend to assume one person's gain is another's loss, but God's reign will be different. Our healing is all bound up together. The last may be first and the first last, but the first are still in the line. The first are not excluded. This is not a story about how outsiders are rewarded and insiders are not. It is a story about breaking barriers and inviting us to welcome our place in the line. After all, Jesus becomes a bleeding body for bleeding bodies. The good news of this story is not just that healing comes in many forms. Healing comes in physical, emotional, social, and otherwise. And we can trust that our most daring and faithful efforts will be met with God's healing touch. But the good news is not just that. It's that Jesus has already smashed through all sorts of barriers that keep us from God and from one another, and Jesus will keep doing that. We are invited to join in that work, to remove the barriers, to help people get in line so that they too can hear son, daughter, beloved, be healed and be made well. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As we turn to the Lord in prayer, we especially offer um, two needs to the Lord. We remember Joe Burr, who is in the hospital at Atrium in Pineville, um, just dealing with some swelling in his feet, hopes to come home early this week. And we also pray for Carrie Levitt, who will have surgery on Tuesday to install her defibrillator. It's been a long delayed, long anticipated procedure and we pray for all of that to go well. Let us pray. Gracious God of love, we are grateful that you have revealed yourself to us. Each of us loved by you as children, each of us precious in your sight, each of us a reflection of you, each of us bound together by love, which is in fact your presence among us. We pray for the health and vitality of the church. You command us to honor you by loving one another, yet all too often there is quarreling and jealousy among us. Enable us to live your law of love as we seek to grow into the full stature of Christ. We pray for all who suffer and are in need. You call us to care for one another with compassion and steadfast love, yet we wither in the face of anguish and brokenness. Equip us <coughs> for the work of reconciliation, that we might offer hope and healing in the power of your name. We pray for all who are sick and are dying. May your will for them be fulfilled. Fill us with your mercy and kindness 
that we may care for them with loving hearts as you bring them into the wholeness of your peace. On this holiday weekend, we recognize that our nation also bears many burdens. We don't trust our leaders. We cannot find ways to work together for the common good. We don't allow the least among us to suffer and languish. We lose our children to endless conflicts and war. We fixate on what divides us rather than on what brings us together as one people. Remind us this weekend of our calling. Remind us of our common creed that all people are created equal. Inspire us to ensure that all your children enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Help us to be profoundly grateful for our freedom and security, and to never take these gifts for granted, and to use them for the betterment of all. God of all life, may peace and justice fill our land, and indeed the whole world. We pray this morning for nations and peoples affected by war and violence, and for places around the globe where people are victimized, where safety is threatened, where freedoms are denied, where life is treated as anything less than sacred. Gracious God, grant us the yoke of Christ, binding us together, tethered by your love, guided by your presence, bringing your kingdom into this world. It's for this kingdom we now pray, using the words Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Our worshiping in the chapel for the summer, we invite you to leave your your tithe and offering in an offering plate as you enter or exit worship, uh, or to scan the QR code on your bulletin to give online. The summer is always one of, uh, of being a little bit more frugal with our resources, and so we appreciate your attention to these things. But we offer our gifts as we enter or leave, and now we give God thanks for all God's good gifts to us, standing and singing together. <laughs>
or you're feeling a little dirty. But we serve a Savior who wants for us abundant, flourishing life. A Savior who reaches out to us and offers us his healing hand. So go to erase some barriers and to remind people that God loves them. Amen. Amen. Amen.